Even if you're comfortable with the cash you have on hand, it couldn't help to have a little bit more, right? That would make things a little more fun to invest in, to save, to spend. So if you are looking for more sources of passive income in your life, then this is the right video for you because I'm going to dive into some of the non-traditional ways that I haven't thought about as an online business owner. If you're coming from more of a corporate background, you're probably going to be like, what? but that's okay. Either way, you're going to learn a lot in today's video, including what my strategy for investing is, because I like to take a very laid back, relaxed approach and still see returns. So you'll find out what I'm doing. Hi, I'm Christina Scalera. And on this channel, I am all about helping you expand your horizons about the kind of wealth that you can create for yourself through either self-employment or from investing. Basically, how can you make more money and how can you save and keep more of it? And also how can you have more fun spending it? So we talk about all things, passive income finance, all that good stuff here on this channel. And if you're new, then you might want to check out some of my past videos where I cover how to actually make a living online because for the last over seven years now, that's what I've been doing. And not only that, but I also successfully exited my online de-commerce, which is a term I came up with. De-commerce is a digital commerce store that sold digital products. And now I get to live between Washington and Colorado. So we're going to dive in and see what you can accomplish in your life starting today, as far as investing and creating more of that passive income goes without your business to do all the work for you. So for anybody who's new here, I recently came into what some would consider a windfall of cash from selling my online business. To give you some perspective, this was basically like I was a builder of a house, right? I had to pay for all the costs and material goods and labor and things like that. And then I sold the house just to like give you some perspective of the kind of numbers that we're talking about here, like a nice house in a high cost of living area kind of thing. And so a couple years ago, I really started my investment journey in earnest and it wasn't really meant to be investments per se, it was more like savings. So if you wanna go and watch my other video, I'm just exactly the same, same hairdo, everything, because I just recorded it right before this, although I think it's like three videos back. It's called How I Saved My First 100K. You'll wanna check that video out. I'll try to remember to link it in the comments. If you watch that video, you know that I started with $5 $5 every single week to invest at some point because you couldn't actually invest. I don't know if they've changed it, but I couldn't actually invest until I had $5,000 in that account. So like the whole first year I had it, it was just sitting there. It didn't actually do anything for me. It wasn't invested. And I think part of this was like, I talk a lot in that video about your identity shift into someone who's better with money because I was not someone who I would consider good with money at the time. However, I think I'm shifting into that person. I still don't confidently think that I'm there yet, but I think I am, you know, sh sh I've shifted quite a bit and I've done a quite bit more than I thought was possible. So that's why I like to share because I'm coming at you as someone who is like the opposite of Dave Ramsey, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, a female, I believe in credit cards, like all the stuff that he basically hates and says in so many words. <laughs> But I think it's important to have real people's perspectives because one thing that I've found in learning about personal finance and investing is that there's a lot of very unrealistic advice and information out there. And it's stuff that doesn't work well for me as someone who's ADHD, has anxiety, OCD. I have a more or less recovered shopping addiction. And a lot of the advice that I hear out there while it works on paper, it does not work for someone like me. So if you find yourself in a similar type situation or you're just listening to stuff and you're like, yep, yeah, nope, that would never work for me because of blah, 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 you're in the right spot. <laughs> But let's talk about investing in stocks. So again, if you haven't seen that video, that's gonna show you how to get the money that you need to start investing. And if you have a little bit of a stockpile, like no pun intended, of cash, then you can start to invest very easily in stocks that are likely to make a good return for you. And the way that I do this is through something called, it's it's kind of like a community called the Bogleheads community that followed Jack Bogle, is it Jack Bogle? I don't know. Anyway, he's the guy that like, I think he founded Vanguard or index funds or something. It doesn't really matter. He's dead, whatever. But basically what index funds have done is revolutionize the investing industry. And you don't have to know a lot about investing or math or anything like that to get started with them. To get started investing in stocks in this way, which 
I would say is a relatively safe way to invest. Now, nothing in this video is like financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not telling you what to do. But in my experience, this is a much safer way to invest in the stock market than just buying individual stocks. Basically, an index fund is like this cute little basket of stocks, and it's like the top 500 stocks that are performing well in the marketplace, like the S&P 500. So we like those stocks because obviously we already know they're doing well. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, go invest in individual stocks because like such and such a company, you know, Tesla, Rivian, whatever, they're just like to the moon. That is such a gamble and you have to get really lucky. So I see investing in individual stocks like that as like buying a lottery ticket. You know, it's it, it, it's kind of fun, it's nice to have, but like I only do it with money that I am absolutely willing to just kind of throw around and play with and not be sad if I lose it because I'm very likely to lose it in an individual stock. However, I think you see a lot of sensationalized accounts and videos about these individual stocks because it's really sexy and fun to see someone go from like $100,000 to like $3 million by investing in one stock. And then they're promising you how to do it. But like, they're also just lying out their butthole because they don't know how to do that. They just got lucky. So if you don't want to get lucky and you want to have a little bit more of what I would consider a sure bet, and also this entire community of Bogleheads believes the same exact thing. <laughs> so I'm not alone. Like it's not like me making this up. This is a very well-established premise in stocks and investing since like the seventies. But the way that I do this is I invest in these index funds and there's two ways to do it. So you can buy an index fund, which has like very, uh, I would consider for someone who's getting started, I would consider these high limits. They're like $3,000, $4,000 to get started just with that index fund. Now the advantage to investing in the actual index fund itself is that the costs are a little bit lower. So if you're on some kind of like fixed income or you just wanna save a little bit of extra money, you can go with the index fund and you can look up lots of videos on how to do that. Personally, I like to go with ETFs, which are the exact same thing as an index fund, except for you can buy as much or as little as you want. There's no minimum per se, except for like the minimum, like one share of the index fund basically. So ETFs are really cool because they have a little bit of a higher fee associated with them. I'm not really worried about that because for the added fee, I get the convenience of being able to buy and sell them whenever I would like. Now, I've never sold them. I just buy and hold actually, just like properties. But that is an option if I ever wanted to do that. They're pretty mobile, very liquid when it comes to actual stocks in your portfolio. And I just, I think they're really fun. So every single week, I'm just buying more and more and more of ETF funds. Now, when it comes to ETFs, there's one important thing to keep in mind. There's a couple of big, big brokerages out there. You know, you've seen their names on the side of buildings that you're driving by or in the hot, in the city or on the highway, whatever. These are names like Schwab, like Fidelity, Vanguard. And every single one of these has their own ETFs and index funds, but we're not gonna talk about that. So when it comes to these ETFs, you can invest in their individual ones. And it's a little bit cheaper if you go with that brokerage. So for example, one of the most popular ETFs is VOO, V-O-O, and that's produced by Vanguard. So obviously it's a lot cheaper to buy it if you have an account, which is free brokerage account at Vanguard. Whatever kind of account you start, you can use that to then buy shares of VU or VTI. I'm not going to get into all the different kinds of like index funds and what they track and stuff, but just know those are like two very popular ones at Vanguard. And if you guys do want me to get into the details, I totally can. I just, I think this would get to be a really long video if I did. So I actually invest with Schwab because you guys have heard me talk in, in previous videos about how much I love Schwab. Their customer service has been wonderful. Their interface is great. It's just, it's been a great experience. And they also just got me early. I was able to set up an account with them in less than 90 seconds at 3 a.m., put my first $5 in, and I've just been with them ever since. The fund that I invest in with them doesn't have like a cute, catchy name, like Vu. It's like, like it's like SWPPX. I had to look it up. <laughs> which just stands for the Schwab S&P 500 index fund. So that's the ETF that I'm actually invested in with them. And I think like the minimum buy-in is something like $60 for one share, I don't know. When I got uh, the cash buyout for my business, I just like maxed out my traditional IRA, put it all into <laughs> whatever it's called. 
and I just let that grow. I think this is a great strategy because there's much smarter, much more dedicated minds at work at Schwab to try to maximize the returns of that ETF. And that's great for my bottom line because as much as they are able to do so, my portfolio only grows. This is as passive as passive income comes. So if you really want passive income, an online shop is wonderful, but I would actually consider that more like residual income where you do the work up front and then you get to like live off of the benefits of that work for a while. This, as far as investments go, is a much more passive play at making money. So if you do want to invest in the stock market, I think a great way to go is either index funds or ETFs. So good luck with that and research what's best for you. Let me know which your favorite ones are down below, especially if you're a fellow Boglehead. Okay, so the second like passive income stream, <laughs> I obviously say that with a lot of hesitancy, is real estate. Like, is it really passive? I don't know. So I think it's, again, more like this residual income thing. So right now I'm doing the work to get a tenant into one of the houses. There's two houses on this property I bought in Colorado, and I'm doing the work to get them into there. And then presumably I will have very little work on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe, you know, once a month have to check in with the tenant, collect their rent, fix any kind of like, oh, whoops, this broke, this drawer became undone, whatever. But for the most part, I'm really excited about it because I've gotten to do a lot of really fun design. I mean, what other asset class? And by the way, an asset is something that makes you money. A liability is something that costs you money. Like an asset is uh, not necessarily a handbag because it's not actually making you money while it's sitting in your closet. A lot of people think it's an asset, it's not. But real estate truly is an asset because not only do I have the same mortgage payment for the next 30 years, I also, have a massive amount of leverage that I was able to put into this house. So leverage just means how much of an investment you're able to get out for the amount of money you're able to put in. Another way to look at leverage is debt. So with the minimal investment that I was able to make on this property, which was 25% of the purchase price because it's an investment property, I was able to get a house that was almost as much as I got for selling my entire business. So even though I put in a small, relatively, I mean, it was still multiple six figures amount of money to buy this house, I have an asset that's worth a lot more. If you look at stocks, you don't have that same kind of leverage. Like you just have what you buy and then it has to accrue different kind of residual payments and dividends and things like that. But you have to wait for those to happen. If I wanted to sell this house in a year, presumably it's gonna be worth more. And in the meantime, with someone renting out one of the houses on the property, I'm gonna be making income called cash flow. There's actually money flowing into a bank account, hence cash flow. So not only am I not paying the mortgage on this place now, like someone else is paying that for me. I also have an asset that's worth a lot more money than I paid after a couple of years, after 30 years for sure. And if you are a lifelong renter, like I was at this exact time a year ago, like I wasn't a homeowner until May of 2022. If you are a renter and you're like, how do I make money in real estate? There's lots of different ways that you could earn income or pay off part of your rent. So if you're landlord or your building allows it, you could take in a roommate. That would be immediate cash flow for you. You can invest in something called real estate trusts, REITs, that are more like stocks that you can fund by just putting money in them every single week. Or as I would encourage you to do, I would love to see you reach out to a couple different loan officers in your area. Now, this is with a huge, 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 like, angel and devil on your shoulder talking. Because when it comes to loan officers, I used to think that they were like there to be like, no, no, no. That's actually underwriting's decision. The loan officer is there to be your cheerleader, to push everything through, and to get whatever sweet, sweet commission or fees or whatever they're getting from closing the house sale that you have purchased. So loan officers are really there to help you find what options are available and how much money you actually need to buy a house. And because my husband's in the military, we were able to get a VA loan on our first property, which was immensely helpful. We didn't need any down payment if we didn't wanna put one down. And we were able to have much lower interest rates as they were climbing for the rest of the industry. So if you are someone who's sleeping on a VA loan, like what are you doing? 
thing. Another option that's like totally slept on are USDA loans. And we made too much money combined to qualify for this thing, but this would have been great for us in the area that we were buying because while it's a rising high cost of living area, it's actually still considered rural on the USDA map. So we could have qualified if we were within the income limits. And that's also a 0% down loan that you could be getting a roommate or having a second house or trailer or something like that on the property. And you can start making money by cash flowing that extra space while you're living there, having someone else pay your mortgage. The most important thing is to talk to a few loan officers because in my experience, I've only worked with women by the way. So, you know, no shade to male loan officers, but I just haven't found someone who's male or identifies as male that did a good job for me. Like, Sorry, not sorry, actually. Actually, funny story, just like a little aside. One of the loan officers I called when we were buying our house in Washington, he had me on speaker and he didn't realize it. And he said a lot of like very negative things about me as a female business owner. So I immediately was like, this is not going to work out. And I went and hired the woman who had been doing this for 25 years. And she didn't seem to say anything bad about me. Maybe she just knows how to work her speakerphone button better, but whatever. So she got my business because of that. And also she was able to present us with a lot of different options. She was very communicative. So just try to find someone that is a good emotional fit for you. And also obviously will give you the best rates and things like that. Now, loan officers, like I said, they are your cheerleaders. So they're there to help you understand what loan options, what products are available for you. Now, this is gonna be so much more helpful than you trying to peruse through a Reddit or TikTok thread or find a video about this on YouTube. I know it actually means you have to go and talk to someone, but most of them are really happy to communicate via just email if that's your style. Either way, it's your loan officer who's gonna be plugged into all the local happenings and availability and products, AKA what kind of mortgage that, you, that you're gonna qualify for. They're gonna be able to help you learn how to improve your credit score or what you need to do in order to qualify for certain loan products. They're also gonna be able to tell you exactly how much you need to put down and everything else that goes into buying a house. They're really like your house buying coach. Like that, I think that's like a more appropriate title for them, except for, you know, they get like a huge kickback or commission or whatever at the end. I used to think that going to a realtor first would help me, but I actually have learned that if you can approach a loan officer first, they can better understand what your situation is. They can help you understand what you're gonna qualify for. And if you don't yet qualify for anything, they can show you exactly what you need to do in order to better qualify in six months or a year or something. So as far as investments go, I would highly recommend that you look into real estate and start connecting with some loan officers until you find one that you like and shop their rate around a little bit after the fact. Not only could you end up with an asset as valuable as real estate, which as Mark Twain said, they're not making any more land. So, and as someone who follows the real estate industry in America very closely, I can tell you that no, they're not making any more land, but they're also bragging their feet a little bit on making more houses. So real estate, I think is a great asset class to invest in. And it's where I'm gonna be focusing even more. Like if we can buy one more house within the next year, I'll be really, really happy. I'm looking at different ways to do that. Like maybe just shifting my primary residence and renting out that first house that we bought in Washington potentially. Now, of course, I cannot let passive income go without mentioning that you can start a business. And when people hear passive income and starting a business, they often don't go hand in hand. And I would tend to agree. I think as you're getting started in business, especially your first one, you are going to F up a lot. You are going to constantly run into expensive mistakes, either to fix or to build upon. So you wanna make sure that if you are starting a business, you're not just doing it for the money. If you have some kind of true passion or talent or gift, or you just wanna get better at some kind of skill and you wanna do that while getting paid for it, I think starting a business is a great venture for you to have. And it's very easy to automate and make a business passive by hiring and creating systems in your business. If this is something you're interested in, just remember there's a few elements of a truly passive business that you must have in place in order to walk away and go on vacation or buy real estate and sit here with no internet <laughs> for a month and record YouTube videos. Like you know, oddly specific, but whatever. So the first is you have to have some kind of ops director. And Nicole Boucher is that in my business. She does it flawlessly. She's helped me to hire people. She's helped me to create systems and automate emails and everything like that. 
The next thing that I have is some kind of content machine. And the content engine that runs my business is Latasha Doyle at Uncanny Content. She is amazing. So I have someone else that is helping me to create the content and to run it. And then on top of that, I have someone that I'm outsourcing as much work as I can. So if you've ever written into customer support, you've had interactions with Lauren, you know how amazing she is. And then finally, our video team, Trina Little, and associates. She and her team are all there to help everything run smoothly. So I have a relatively small team. They are all contractors, but if I did not have this team, nothing would actually happen because I am too ADHD and inconsistent to make anything happen. So I am happy to pay them each and every month to make sure that the content is posted, that the customers and clients are happy, and that my YouTube videos are getting posted, which sometimes doesn't happen through no fault of them. It's because I'm late. Honestly, my day-to-day -day of running this business or even my shop looked like waking up, having a nice slow morning, and then checking my email, making sure there's no fires, getting into any kind of client meetings. Like I usually have client meetings on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and then wrapping the day up around three o'clock by creating any kind of freebies or funnels, anything that we need to do. On Thursdays, I like to record YouTube videos, unless I'm really behind, and then it's like, it's today, Monday or Tuesday, I don't remember. Anyway. <laughs> It's not a Thursday and I'm recording this. So that's basically all that I have to do for my businesses because everything else is being taken care of through these automations and through this outsourcing. So that's pretty much as passive as it gets, just showing up to do a couple of videos, respond to a few emails that Lauren couldn't answer herself because of whatever complex need they were asking about, and then just making sure that, yeah, basically everything is getting published and put out there. So I get to have a lot of fun. I get to be really creative. I get to have nice slow mornings where I think of new business ideas and what directions I want to head in. And I would say that's pretty much as passive as business gets. So even though I am doing a lot more with my business than I have in the past, I'm actually working less in and on it because of all these hires that I've made. And if you're a coach or some kind of online product seller or any kind of service-based business, the fourth thing you can do is add digital products to your website and to your online presence because people often wanna buy from you, but you're not always available. Sometimes you have to do things like sleep and have any kind of life outside of work. And if you have digital products, people can still get a taste of your work. They can still buy from you any time of the day or night, any day of the year. So if you wanna add digital products, to your online presence, I highly recommend you start doing that sooner rather than later because it's so easy to plug in future content that you'll create. And if you're really interested in making this work right from the beginning, you'll wanna check out my Launcher Shop Academy, which walks you through the A to Z start process of creating that perfect product for you that's gonna sell well and getting it all set up. And I even cover all those like little customer support details that can hang you up. So check out Launcher Shop Academy at christinascalera.com. Also, did you just see what I did there? <laughs> I just told you, yep, that you can plug it in your content. And then I did that, cool. Okay, so then fifth and finally, this is something that I haven't really played around with, but if you are a true OG and you have followed me for a long time, you know that I have two horses and one is very elderly. He is not a rental asset by any means, but the other one is quite desirable. And I've had several people offer to buy him from me. He's an excellent trail horse. He's just very steady, very calm. He's basically a big golden retriever. And I've toyed with the idea of renting him out per ride or like for a couple hours every single month, because it would also benefit him to get out of the pasture, see more of the world and just get a little exercise and fresh air. He likes it. If you don't have horses, which I don't expect most of you to have horses. You will have other assets in your life that you can potentially rent out to someone who is in need of them for a short period of time. Things like a car, like if a friend is moving to a new city and you have an extra car, you could rent that car to them for the month. If you are a really good designer and you have lots of really cool furnishings and little things around your house, furniture, things like that, you could go and stage houses with your furniture, effectively renting it out. If you have a little extra storage space, either extra parking in front of your house or on the side of your house, maybe a storage shed that you can clean out and empty, 
you could rent that out as extra storage space or a parking spot or RV spot for someone. And if you live on lots of land, you could even have some kind of like RV park where people just pull up and hook into like electric and water, just maybe one or two of those on your property where they're renting that out every single night. I find that when you start to look at everything in your life as an asset or a liability, you can start to see which assets are also rentable and can continue to cash flow for you even after you purchase them. Whether it's a spare room in your house or a horse, or maybe even an extra storage shed in your backyard, all of those things have the potential to cash flow. And when they're cash flowing that easily, it's pretty passive. So in 2023, when it is harder than ever for us millennials or you Gen Zers to get ahead in life because of all the NIMBYs and whatever else that's happening out there, there are still ways that you can create assets for yourself that rack up cash in your bank account in a very passive way. So take some of this, let me know what your favorite method is, what you're most excited to start or look into after this video. And no matter how small it is that you start, start somewhere because once you understand that you are no longer capped by whatever someone else told you is your income on a w-2 job like a nine to five you are limitless and you can create as many income possibilities and opportunities for yourself as you want i would really love to help you continue to sit back watch this money flow in and honestly work, but work on only the things that you're most interested and passionate about. If that sounds like something you're interested in too, make sure you check out the other videos on this channel, especially the one that just popped onto your screen. And make sure you're subscribed because that way you won't miss any future content. If I can keep up with YouTube, you'll see me again this week. And if not, <laughs> I'll see you next week.